Mark Chang on stage. Come on, come on up stage. Um, we're going to have a, um, uh, the VUT fireside chat, uh, um, which will be um, a very thrilling chat between two, let's say, uh, VIPs of the independent music business. And it's um, Alison Wenham coming on stage. Yeah, you can, you can go there. Great. Alison Wenham, she's the CEO of the Association of Independent Music and the Worldwide Independent Network. And um, on the other side, there is uh, Mark uh, Chung, the, uh, also, of course, an expert uh, uh, on independent music business. Here they are on stage. So welcome. Yeah, just give a small applause. <laughs> Take a seat. And, uh, of course, um, and he's the founder and the CEO of the Freiburg Music uh, Verlag, Verlag in English. So um, I'm looking forward uh, to a very interesting chat um, about the VUT motto, uh, which everybody probably knows. It's um, act globally united, stay independent. And uh, the Win Manifesto, what is it all about? And, of course, all the different aspects on a... Um, global, worldwide uh, work collaboration uh, among all these independent music industries. So, um, yeah, I forward um, you, Alison. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was told I'm interviewing you. It's not a chat. So, and then I read the program. It says we're having a chat. But it's an, inter so it's an interview chat. Well. So, hello and welcome. And uh, I think we'll take questions any time, if any arise, because we, we don't really have a big agenda. Uh, we thought we'd try and cover some of the aspects of the work Alison does at Wynn, as I'm interviewing her, and at AIM. So, shall we jump straight in? Although, I, I was trying to find out on the way up here, I have a British passport, but my, I haven't been in England for a long time. And I, saw, I read in the program that Alison received an OBE, that's Order of the British Empire? So, and I know when men get that, you say Sir Alison, but it would, is it Lady Alison, or what is the correct? It's just play now, Ali. Al. Ali will do. <laughs> just Al. <laughs> Things aren't in the empire as they used to be. <laughs> anyway, so um, maybe we should start with trade associations, because uh, Wynn would not exist if uh, we didn't have a situation that we had an independent trade association or an association of independent music companies in surprisingly many territories. And I was thinking before, I thought, I don't think there was ever a, a global plan of independence to set up trade associations in every country. I know there was a little bit of prodding in America to set up A2IM, but it, it seems to have happened all by itself. Is, is that your impression as well, that, that independents in each territory on their own came to the conclusion we should set up a trade association? That's right, Mark. I mean, some trade associations like Canada and I think VUT have been in existence for a long time. Um, AIM started in 99. And AIM started for a very particular uh, set of reasons, which were to do with what had gone on in the 80s and 90s with massive concentration of the music industry away from what essentially was you know, a cottage industry, large players and small players, but all very even and balanced, through quite rapidly uh, a multinational industry. And that all happened within 10 years. And as we came towards the end of the 90s and there was that feature uh, which was accelerating, the purchasing of independence and then the purchasing of each other, the majors were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the independents felt um, threatened. And the other reason was the advent of you know, what we call the internet, but all that went with mobile technology, all that went with the massive changes that the industry was going to have to address. Um, and the time was right. So we started AIM, uh, found that lots of trade associations, as you say, already existed around the world. I think Canada is the oldest one. Um, and we looked to America because there was a plan to have a global association. But without America, that wasn't going to be possible. And America was the final frontier. It was a very difficult thing to get the Americans to come together because it's not in their genes. I mean, in America, they're very, um, I, they're, they're very individualistic as a society. They're most, the most individualistic society on earth. So they don't share success. So it, 
you know, success is a very unique thing. And I kept being knocked back. I kept going over there, and they kept saying, you know, we don't do collective anything. And it was in South by Southwest when it was actually, I had decided myself that I was, this was the last time. If I couldn't pull it off, it wasn't going to happen. And if it wasn't going to happen, we couldn't then uh, move forward with a global association. And I sat in a room with um, dozens of labels, and somebody started talking about this individualistic streak. And I thought, you know, here we go. I've listened to this now for six, seven, eight times. And then somebody else in the room turned around in some wonder and looked at all his colleagues and he said, yeah, he said, but he said, hang on a minute. He said, the ones that made it to the West Coast in the 19th century were the ones that put their wagons in a circle. And that was the moment A2IM was born. They realized that it was in their history. And provided they could justify collective action because historically it was validated. And after that, it all happened incredibly quickly. And they're a wonderful organization. Yeah, they're doing they're, they're very well. They're shining light now. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Interesting. The, the VUT, I, I know a little about. The VUT is 93, so fairly early as yeah. well. And I think when it was founded, it's very much for it's very straight economic reasons, because you can ha negotiate a discount if you have a trade association and you got 20% discount on, uh, on Gamer for instance, which was a, really the one big strong argument and it was very easy to get people to join because you join and you get, save 20% pretty, uh, well Germans go for that, you know, not only Germans probably. And actually it only became a more political and, uh, well, more political organization much later in my, in my perception. So, but, but AIM was from the, from the outset set up to, to combat developments in the market. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, so maybe we then move on to to win, which is uh, which is quite young, right? When, when did it start? And well, you and I were there at the beginning. I mean, win started very tentatively, very slowly, very gently, because of the character of independent companies around the world and their trade associations. What you definitely don't want to do is become some sort of autocracy, you know, some sort of you know, head office where orders are issued. We don't have that power, we don't have that reach, we don't have that will, that inclination. What we wanted to do was to build WIN gently as a, as a, a community, a consensual community. And I suppose that it was only a couple of things, creation of the council, and the ex and Merlin, Merlin came into being five years ago, um, that really triggered what now has become a very grown up organization very quickly. But what I sense around the world, from Korea to South America to Europe uh, to Australia, a great sense of pride that we are now part of a very powerful collective voice. And that voice has been exercised um, very loudly during this summer. Yes, I, I thought it would be good to talk about that. I, I thought because I thought the 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 role when when played in the dispute with YouTube was a very good example. Um, and we've said in Germany, it we saw it as a, a very practical uh, evidence of the what was before not an empty slogan, but really an unproven slogan of being independent and acting united. Do you want to tell us a bit how the YouTube thing came about? Well, I mean, there, there are patterns in history, there are lessons in history. I think everything, history really teaches us everything uh, about how we should behave. And unfortunately, some companies don't tend to value history and they don't tend to read it. But in fact, the roots of YouTube lie in many previous um, engagements AIM has had and probably other trade associations have had, where you start with this very simple premise, just because you're independent, I don't perceive any credible argument to say that you should be paid nothing or you should be paid less. I just don't think that argument runs. There are certain practical um, operational uh, issues that, that might be valid. 
but you can deal with those in an operational, logical way. But to start on the premise that for majors there is one price and for independents there is another is, an, is, is simply unjustifiable. Now, independents around the world are as different from each other as they are from the majors. And we respect that difference and we actually celebrate that difference. But when it comes to the threat which might be to your existence, to, to our collective existence, that's a very different thing. Uh, independents can make up their own mind about how they want to do business and with whom. So we don't tell people that they should or shouldn't do a deal with X or Y or Z. That is a commercial um, right of, of the companies. But simply speaking, one day, all the phones across the world started ringing. All the phones across the world started ringing from Asia, the States, Europe, the UK. And it seemed that YouTube had issued a very hostile uh, threat, which was that if they didn't sign a particular contract, which was non-negotiable, um, the access to certain um, aspects of the YouTube system, the content management tool, the channels, uh, would, be, would be terminated. And uh, to uh, the enormous amazement, I think, of us all, uh, Wynn rose up and just went to, how can I say, the, went to the defense of companies who have no defense themselves. Yeah, I, I think it's, we perceive that here, it's, it's, a, it's a role of trade organizations that is extremely important because we live in a situation where it's suicidal or very dangerous for companies. We have very dominant players in the market and that by definition means that a single company going up against you know, Amazon or against uh, now against YouTube or, or Google, its parent company, um, can be absolutely suicidal for that company. And I think we've, we've all come to the conclusion that there is a, an obvious role for trade associations to play here because it's much easier for us to being one step removed there to stand up and say this is unacceptable than it is for any single company. Um, in a way, it's a bit like a union, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. I mean, the NDAs that were issued were so uh, uh, draconian that I understand the companies couldn't even admit there was one. You know, um, when you lock down communication to that extent, um, then you compromise the company's ability to make a determination um, that is a balanced and fair uh, trade between two, con con two, two contracting parties. You, you lock them down. You, you remove a great deal of, of um, negotiating room. So the trade associations are free to represent their members' interests, and that's what we did, and we did it magnificently well. Um, it was a story that caught the imagination of the press across the world, and it caught the imagination of television news. It made, it made yeah. national news in, in United Kingdom and in the US, and I happened to be in the US when, it, when, you know, when, when they were covering it, so I was able to do quite a lot of television there as well. And, you know, journalists like the story because it's a sort of David and Goliath thing. You know, what I find sad about this is that, as I said, the lessons are there in history. The independents will not sign second-class deals. They, they, just read about it. You know, there are independent companies who might, and there are independent companies who have. But there are some independent companies who are members of all of our trade associations and who are very large companies who will not. They will not sell their copyrights for less than really, you know, the, the true the value, value, the market value. And it is to their credit, and the reason why we are able to sit here, that this union exists globally. And they believe, unlike a lot of other companies, they believe that the strength and the future of this industry lies with smaller, newer companies. So they believe that giving those companies uh, room and to come into the same room and achieve the same parity uh, and compete, I'm a great believer in competition, I think competition is good for music, it's good for artists, it's good for industry, but you've got to start on a level playing field. I, I think that's. It's, I think you touch on a subject there because what we've seen has been a strategy in these conflicts, has always been then that the uh, 
um, dominant market players have then, when they met that kind of resistance, that they went out and tried to buy out single companies or they picked the larger ones and offered them preferential deals. And it's, I think it's been a learning curve that we've all been pleasantly surprised that more people uh, took this time because I think there was a, a similar situation with YouTube a couple of years earlier where Merlin had great problems asserting their, what they were demanding because uh, Google went out and contacted single companies, offered them preferential deals and broke up the front really because at the end of the day we're all business people. We run a company, we have responsibility for our artists, we have responsibility for the people who work at the company. So it's very difficult sometimes to stand up then and say, well, I'm, I don't want the 20 million advance you're offering me and it's great that you're giving me better percentages, uh, but I want a deal for everybody. That really requires a very uh, well, a broader view of things and a more long-term view of things. I think that, that goes beyond. I, I think we were all quite surprised and uh, there's not so much to say about it, but I think it took ourselves by surprise how actually easily the global campaign was organized against that because I know essentially there were two meetings or something like that. It, it felt like we had two meetings where we had a lot of people in the room from around the world and we said, no, we're not going to go with this. And then all we needed to say really was, okay, everybody go home, contact your local media, contact your, your local companies, your labels, your members, explain the situation and take action. And we were quite amazed when we, uh, a couple of days later, we had a real global media reaction, a real global activity on it. And I think uh, we took YouTube a bit by surprise on that one, weren't we? <laughs> Massively. Yeah, we certainly did. I think they weren't at all prepared for that. But, you know, again, and the sake of repeating myself, the lessons are there uh, in history. We had a similar issue with MTV back in 2004, who, you know, decided one day that independent videos were worth... 40% of the previous contract. Uh, and as far as we could see, there was no evidence base to confirm that. Um, and I think that time and again, since we've had AIM and A2IM and WIN um, and other trade associations, people have underestimated what we can do. And uh, it's, it's really... Um, it's really dangerous to do that because, you know, if you're going to go to market with a service, you know, the expectation, uh, and Paul was saying earlier on, you know, everything is available everywhere, um, legitimately or illegitimately. Everything is available everywhere. If you look at Spotify, if you look at Deezer, you'll see that, you know, everything is available bar, you know, the things that have been held back because of exclusives. Um, so how on earth would... YouTube or any other company think that they could be successful with, you know, less than 100% of what's available somewhere else. So I, it's almost self-harming to take this route. And there's also, I think, a great deal of hubris involved. I think that when you do a deal with majors, you know, and I'm a great believer in tough negotiations, it's part and parcel of what we do. This is the music industry. So you expect a tough negotiation. Uh, but you do a deal with three majors and then you go, phew, you know, I've got, got the bits of paper. And now we're just going to sweep up the indies um, at our leisure on terms that we've set. Uh, and, you know, we just, and they didn't expect any issue. I don't think they expected any difficulties. Um, but, you know, Paul's company, Paul's um, G um, Digital Music News, isn't it? They actually published the contract. Now... I hadn't seen the contract. I don't see the contract. I don't do the negotiations. I don't get involved with that side of things. I don't know how he got it. No, I don't know how he got it either. <laughs> but, you know, he published, he published the contract. And, I mean, like many, many people around the world, I was reading this thing in amazement. How could they possibly expect companies to sign that? But at the same time, I, I think it's more well, my perception is there's no reason to be complacent. Is the YouTube thing is not over, is it? What, what is the status there at the moment? Well, I, I believe that negotiations are still ongoing. Um, and they're very tough. I think that there will be a positive outcome. I, um, well, having worked at Sony for 10 years, I, I have a couple of theories about it myself, which are actually very, well, they're actually very simple because 
you know, as, as it happens, then you, you know the people there, you go, well, Lucian Grange, how many years has he got left on his contract? Um, and if they get a big advance, there's a rumor they got 850 million or something like that. If they get it under conditions where not all of it is accountable to artists, if the royalties are so low that they can make projections saying, oh, pff, it's going to take ages until royalties ever reach that level, then they can book a lot of profit into, into their books in that year. And 800 million for Universal is a big fat amount of profit, and it's a big fat a uh, bonus check for the executive running a major company. And it's, you know, it's, uh, there's no value judgment necessarily in that. But we ha I think it's very simple to see that the, intro the set of interests is very different. And maybe that comes to, that's part of, or, or part of the core really, what sets independence aside from majors. And um, uh, knowing both sides, I'm, uh, I'm not even yeah. ridden by a lot of, of value judgments there. Mm -hmm. I think there are good people working in major companies as well, and they're all they're humans, and they but they have a very different set of interests. It's a short term. It is really a short term set of interests. Especially amazing day, absolutely amazing day. Um, in the manifesto, which by the way you can go onto the Win website. It's winformusic.org. Um, uh, you can go onto that website and you can read the manifesto, which sets, it's an ideology, you know, it's a series of statements, a series of um, objectives, uh, which we hope and we hope, you know, all of the companies that are members of the trade associations subscribe We could to. agree on. Yeah. But one of, one of the things that we've written quite extensively about in the manifesto is the role of the artist. Because, I mean, it sounds such a simple, almost stupid thing to say, but without the artist, this industry doesn't exist. Um, artists are the lifeblood of the industry. Without artists, we wouldn't be here, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, we might be having another conversation, but, I mean, you're an artist from time past, so, so am I. You know, and uh, we went into business, um, but, I, you know, I never undervalue the... the the, the role, the importance, the, the it's 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 the DNA of the industry. Now we seem to have got into a fairly bad place with artists generally. I'll we'll talk about our role more specifically in a minute. But uh, everybody knows that artists are feeling more and more concerned about the um, revenues coming from streaming services and from digital deals generally. Um, Yes, streaming is a very different business model. It's a consumption, not a purchase model. It's an access, not an ownership model. So the per stream rate is, you know, a tiny, tiny amount of money. Now, in and of itself, I believe that streaming services will come good from a revenue perspective because of the scale and the reach of streaming services in the future. And already streaming services are becoming very, very good, stable revenue for record companies. And for those record companies who share um, the income fairly with their artists, then it stands to reason the artists are also beginning to see stable and fair and strong, robust and growing revenues. Yeah. Can I just Maybe say that? Yeah. But, the, but the problem for some groups of artists is that the structure of the deals... Um, have actually has actually taken the value away from the streaming rate and buried it in all sorts of new and strange and somewhat wonderful and weird um, um, sort of charges like an access fee. So if you want to talk to a major, there's an access fee. Just to have that conversation. I'd like to charge that. <laughs> there's an administration fee. There's a delivery fee, there's maybe equity, there's maybe minimums, there's maybe guarantees, there's breakage, there's packaging deductions, there's all these strange... So you get to a point where there's a very... You mentioned 850, I've heard 600 to a billion, who knows what it is, but it's a large amount of money. There's gone on the books and some of that, possibly all of it, is what's called unattributable. Does everybody know what that means? That means that does not flow down to the catalogue, to nicht, the artists. Nicht Gelder, ja. Yeah. Also nicht, hm. Now, what we've done this summer, because, you know, if we don't work in partnership with our artists, if we don't have fair and respectful, open, 
honest relationships, transparent relationships with our artists, then I don't believe we deserve to be in business. Because frankly, artists could be in business themselves and find partners who would be fair and would be transparent. So we've launched the Fair Digital Deals for Artists, which uh, is again on the website. And it's a very simple set of statements, but the companies that have signed this, and there are about a thousand companies already across the world, and growing all the time. So if you haven't signed it, or you're not aware of it, go on to win. You can sign any day, become part of this, this family. And it says very, very simply, it says unattributable income. That is to say, if there are things that Merlin do, because Merlin is structured to get the best value, and it might be in some of those so-called non-attributable things, because that's how the licensee wants to structure the deal for their purposes, we will pass that on. We will pass that on to the artist in a, in a pro rata fashion. And the companies have signed this pledge and that goes down to royalty statement level. So when the royalty statement run is next made, the, the, the digital deals declaration, the promise, the pledge will go with that. So any artist signed to any company that signed that declaration will know that that company is not withholding from them, the artist, the value of the deal. Yeah, I think there's been a period where, where we've sometimes found out that we do share interests with the majors. We're all affected by piracy and all that. But I think the digital deals have really been an area where um, the independents have behaved very differently from the majors. Or most, I mean, everybody does their business in a different way. But I think you can almost generally say, because I manage some artists as well, so uh, I know whenever I deal with a major on that, when an artist signed to a major, they're all forced into horrible digital deals. It's, it's, they're being shafted on every level. Uh, for, for starters, the PPD is treated the same as the income coming from digital service providers, although majors have much less costs associated with it, et cetera, et cetera. I think most people know, know the mechanics of it. And yeah. I think it's a real chance for independence yeah. to treat artists differently and to set ourselves apart. Yeah. And I think that there, a lot of the importance of the Fair Digital Deal Declaration lies in that, in drawing that line and not being part. Because I've been saying to, to majors every time in these negotiations, you are shooting yourself on the foot because right now a lot of artists are so desperate that they're, as soon as some, as, if anybody's willing to invest into them, they will accept the small print on the digital uh, clauses and they're being told if you don't sign it this way, oh, it's going to be hard to get the deal approved and all, all this nonsense that goes on there. And I was surprised how many experienced managers accept these clauses as they are. And I think it'll come back to bite the majors because at the moment digital income, especially what has flown through to artists, is still quite small. Yeah. But the day is not far away when big artists will really look at their royalty statements and they will understand, the managers will understand very clearly how much they're shafted because we all know, you know iTunes charges 99 cents or 129 and you can just see if you're only getting 7.5 yeah, cents, you, you, mean, you know you're being shafted. You're, you're exactly right. And I think what we're doing is preparing the ground for the day when that realization finally comes home. And uh, you know we've worked very closely with the artist groups around the world who were they said it was a game changer. They said that there is honesty in this industry. How rare to find that. How rare to come across that. Honesty, fairness and transparency. That day will come and then there'll be a long list of companies to whom those managers can go in the knowledge that those companies have already declared to the world that they will be uh, you know, fair and transparent with, uh, with their artists. We kind of skipped across Merlin because I personally think Merlin is is one of the real serious achievements. We've, we've you know, I think we all wish sometimes we could have achieved more in the in the independent community. But I think Merlin has been a huge success story and a very important step. Do you want to talk a bit about why yeah, it sure. came about? And I mean, and Merlin was born out of a clear, a, a, a simple construct. The fact is that the independent sector is structured in such a way that it's easy to diminish the value. Um, but at the same time, we, ha we, we obviously respect the entire supply chain. Independents are serviced by distributors around the world, aggregators, and so on. So, you know, you have to respect the routes to market are very different in the independent sector. That said, you've got some companies who are managing their digital assets uh, themselves, and you've got other companies who've got an array of third-party 
providers, service providers. But at the core of that, you've got one simple tenet, which is that you know you want to do a deal, you want to make it simple, and you want to get the best value for all of the copyrights. So Merlin was born out of an acknowledgement that we hadn't structured ourselves globally that well to be able to do you know a global deal and make it fairly easy to access what now is three I think rising possibly to four million tracks four million tracks I think I know it's three I've made, uh, lots lots so you know if you're a big service provider and at the moment there are seemingly only only the really big service providers that's surely uh, a very simple way to you know to, to to make a contract and so we we built merlin out of a need to fix some of the market dysfunctionality that is a natural feature of the independent sector so the distributors are absolutely key to the success of merlin and what was needed was to put aside some competitive interests and realize that the bigger prize for everybody was not to fight amongst each other for who was distributing what, because that goes on anyway. That's about service, it's about relationship, it's about cost, it's about um, menu of, of you know, uh, services that you can get. But to put aside that one thing which was because remember, distributors are service providers themselves. They don't own the copyrights they represent. The copyrights have to be put at the head of the dragon. They are the things that get valued. And then everything else works very well. Yeah, I, I, to put it very simply, I, I thought, and I think it was the MySpace discussion, the truth was we realized, I think, when MySpace said, well, okay, we've only done deals with the majors, but how are we supposed to do deals with 150,000 independent labors around the world? That there was some truth in that. It was very difficult before Merlin existed for a service provider to do a deal for independent repertoire. It was an actual need. And uh, I yeah. think it's good that we actually yeah. came up, we came up with a solution. Well, Merlin uh, yeah. will, I think, easily go past 80, 90 million uh, this year. It has, um, I mean, it manages to get things for the independent sector. And bear in mind, Merlin is a not-for-profit. It's running at about 2.5% administration fee. Um, if you want to see what Merlin does, it's www.merlinnetwork.org. Um, Many distributors are members of, of uh, Merlin, including Fine Tunes here, and or, uh, not Orchard, uh, Fine Tunes and, and others. Um, but Merlin, for example, owns equity in Spotify. Now, how did that happen? You know, that the independent sector could actually get some of the value of the company it's doing business with, which is something the majors have been doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if that's the way deals can be structured, there's value, there's investment, there's a sort of partnership. In, well, the, the potential problem in it is that it creates value that does not have to be accounted to artists under the existing rules. That's the, the, there's problematic. That's but right. I, but I let's say let's say as, that Merlin, um, let's say that Spotify went public or, or sold, Merlin's equity would be realised and passed to its members. So that would be a windfall that has never existed before. No, absolutely. I think big step. I, I, because we've touched on this. On this, you mentioned the, that you believe in the uh, the positive effect of, of streaming, um, and I've said the same here a couple of times. And I know it's it's a matter that you know Helene was here yesterday. A lot of artists do not agree to that, and understandably so because the royalties they receive are indeed very small. But um, I, I'm quite happy to repeat the, the two reasons I, I tend to think that because to me they're quite logical. The first one is that the the paid tier of Spotify, people paying 99 a month mean we have people paying 120 euros a year or 120 pounds a year for music and we have never had many of those people. And there might be a few who used to pay more but there are definitely very many who are now spending more on music than they did before. And I think when I realized the way Spotify accounts that they take the money that is from uh, that they receive from these 9.99 paying uh, subscribers, and they distribute that on the songs they're listening to. That automatically means that the more mainstream it gets, the more people start using the service who are not such intense music users. So by definition, and I know for myself, I have periods where I don't listen to music that much, and I know a lot of people who actually don't listen to music that intensely, and that's great. And they obviously all pay 9.99 as well. So by definition 
the amount of money will eventually be spread among less streams in relation to that. So I think there is a very high likelihood that the compensation per stream will increase over the years. But And the biggest problem that we have to resolve, and that's I think that's why it's so important that we... Questions raise. out there, yes, or anything you exactly. want to ask, or... Uh, views, hold on a second, let's get a... Oh, we're going to be shafted on this. Damn, they're here. <laughs> they're going to kill us on Spotify. Hi, Alison. It's Kim uh, Appleby. How are you? I'm, very, I'm good. How are you? Good, good. I'm good. Thank you. Um, I think we have a huge responsibility to make a distinction, a really clear distinction between the artist and a songwriter. Yeah. Because I think there's two different things happening here. When you talk about an artist, for me, I think of someone, say, like Rihanna, yeah. who doesn't write. But ironically, is worth millions. Yeah. She's worth more than the people that are actually putting pen to paper. And I think that we need to really talk about the writer and stop calling the writer, you know, stop referring to the artist. Because when you say the artist, for me, it's kind of a, a pop thing. Can I, can I interrupt you straight away and say, yeah. we represent record companies and therefore, we, I mean, I'm not in the publishing business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not what AIM was set up to do. I okay. absolutely understand your point. Um, but when we say artists, we really do mean, the, they may be the songwriter as well, um, but AIM and WIN and A2IM and all of those organisations that we've talked about, VUT. No, VUT is different. Yes. But you see, Alison, with an artist, I mean, you know, let's talk about Adele. She's a singer-songwriter. Yes. She's an artist. No, no, I know that they She can go out and earn. She has the chance to make merchandise. And I know that, that you're not, uh, it's not about the writer, it's just that being a writer, it's just so frustrating to hear everyone continuously talking about the artist. Because the truth is, if you think the artist is being screwed, the writer is way down there. I mean, yeah. it's like I know. the artist I know. is making nothing. I know. The, but where the are your trade associations? Where are your advocates? Where are your wins? We're, we're, we're on the SEC at the Basque. You know, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm with the British Academy of Songwriters and Composers, and yeah. I sit on the SEC. And right now, we are really going for the you PROs. Should. Well, we are. We are. We're in the middle of going for the NDAs because it's the NDAs that are completely disgraceful, destroying it for writers. And I, I just don't know what. I other uh, corporation would allow yeah. an NDA to exist where someone's kind we of wouldn't represented. Have done it. We and wouldn't know. I it. think it's nuts. And I really kind of took my hat off to the Indies, you know, a few months ago when they re uh, absolutely refused because we've kind of created a monster. It's our own fault in, in, in a way. And we're kind of now playing catch up with the whole yeah. thing. You but you know, see, but we, we're, we're letting that monster feel the pain of what was taught to me many, 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 many years ago. I was in the independent sector, again, record company, so I can't speak for writers. No. I don't know enough about writing. Mark does. He'll say something in a minute. But when I was in the record industry, I ran an independent company. That became really quite a successful independent company, and we became successful by doing things differently. I'm female. I tend to think laterally. I don't think in the same way uh, as, as seemingly the blokes in the industry that I was in. So we would go and do deals that were announced and, and absolutely took the industry by surprise. And I walked into a room one day full of all of these blokes uh, who ran the big record companies and the biggest gorilla in the room who could actually reduce grown men to tears just by speaking to them came up to me and he said... He said to me, he said, um, he said, well done on the deal. I'd just done a huge deal and I'd taken their market share down by about 10 points and mine up by 10 points, literally overnight. He said, well done on the deal and I felt a chill run down my spine. And he said, sometimes, he said, you pygmies, and he actually called me a pygmy. He said, he did. He, he said, sometimes you pygmies can bite the legs of us elephants very hard but in the end when we trample over you we don't even know we've done it and he said this to me he said this to me and you know I, I've, I remember these things I tuck them away because you know it's those sorts of lessons in history that drive what I do today so that not only will we bite the legs of the elephants but we will not be forgotten and we will not be banished from history. 
Now, Mark wants to say something about writing, because you represent... Uh, yeah, writers. but first of all, we like adversity in a way, don't we? we you, you don't really start out as an independent company if you don't feed off adversity a bit. We were talking earlier, and we thought the, the YouTube dispute was, in a way, galvanizing, because it was really... We were all really annoyed. It was unacceptable, and it kind of sometimes brings out the best in people. No, I, ju I just wanted to say, I think there, there is... It's, it's right to say, Alison works for trade associations that are strictly labels, and um, VUT is a bit different in that sense because at some point we realized almost all our members were doing something else outside. Uh, originally we were for labels as well, but then we asked people what, when we did research with, with members, we figured out very quickly, a lot of them were also running publishing companies, many were organizing concerts, some were organizing festivals, they'd taken over mail order, they were doing all kinds of things. Yeah. So we changed the membership rules yeah. consciously and actually changed the name of the organization. And I think in that sense, things are growing together a bit more because yeah. and in a way it's a very late follow-up because yeah. songwriters and performers used to be very separate. I think probably up until the 60s when yeah. the Stones and the Beatles started performing their own songs. I think that was fairly new then. Mm. We, we're um, the same. I mean, in 2000, we were, when I looked at our board, we were all record companies. That, that reflected the times then. Today, 75% of my board also have publishing interests. They have management interests. They have merchandise. They have live events. They have all sorts of income streams because that's the way the last decade has driven the business because revenues you know, were under pressure uh, as the transition from physical to digital uh, started and is still going on. So I think it was a driven by need as much as anything else to diversify income streams. But the point I'm making is that the, the root, if you like, the core philosophy is copyright ownership. Um, I've often wondered that same question, you know, where are the voices that are standing up to the behaviour of some of the licensees and just saying no? Now I'm not empowered by publishers or writers to be that person. But there surely has to be people out there who are. But you look to your organize, you know, that's where that, that resides. Yeah, but what, what I would add is I think it is the right time to start communicating. And we've, yeah, we're doing that because obviously more your, more your representatives well, yeah. are the, the copyright collection societies. And we have a lot one of communication. Down there, quick one. Yeah. Just one short question. We are running out of time. Yeah. But yeah, very, very quick. Uh, yeah, hi there. Um, I'm, a, I'm a record label, small indie record label. Um, you, you talk about a fair digital deal for artists. What sort of percentage do you think is a fair deal? I mean... That's not for me to say. Um, you mean in terms of splits? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, well, of, I think uh, I've got the, a fair deal. Uh, most, most independent companies that I know of are splitting 50-50 after costs. Some of the larger companies are moving from 50 down to perhaps 40 um, as that business grows exponentially because they need to reinvest in new artists. So there's no, I mean, it's up to every individual company to determine how they want to split between artists, but that's the norm, I think. Now, I think the majors have still based on they based royalties on, yeah, they pay they pay you the album share as a standard so you have a 20% deal on a, on a license deal or maybe even 12 or 15% on an artist deal and if you've got bad luck uh, they treat a download as a single with a half royalty so you end up with 7% or some nonsense like that um, which is really ridiculous but I, I think Maybe if to, to make that clear, the Fair Digital Deal Declaration very much focuses on aspects like saying the obligation is to make transparent what you're doing with the royalties so that the artist can see yeah. this is what's coming that's in, this is the share I'm getting. And a that's and the, the second aspect, I think, which is important in there is to say to generally treat income that a labor receives mm -hmm. even though it has the option of mm. treating it mm. as not allocatable and being able to say to the artist, well, I got this money, but it's, I can't really say if it's yours or not, yeah. uh, to treat that differently and to say, well, income I receive from these services is for the catalogue and yeah. it's for the artist overall, so I will take that money and yeah. I will appropriate as good as I can, which usually will be to, to appropriate a pro rata to the turnover that the artists have had in that period. And that's the obligation that's there, and Alison's absolutely right. It wouldn't be right for a trade association to tell a label how they should do their deals and how much percentage, but transparency and treatment of non-allocatable income are two extremely important methods, we think, and that we would always recommend and welcome any label to 
to do, agree to. And I think it's in our own interests in the long term uh, for our relationships with artists, not less. Yeah, that, that answers my question. I mean, I, I'm, I am in the 50, 50, 60, 40 bracket. One of the good already, guys, then. So I was, I was just wondering whether that was fair or not, but it sounds like. Yeah, Sounds like it. But as Mark says, it's not about the actual rate. We can't tell people how to run their companies. Sure, yeah. But what we do want is for artists and record companies to be clear and fair. As I'm repeating what Mark said. So, yeah. I think we need to get off here, don't we? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank, thank, you. thank you very much for this thank um, you. Thank wonderful, you for amazing me. conversation. So, uh, just a little chat, but so... Interview. Uh, yeah. An interview, thank you. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs>